Beyond just saying that it's Easter, uh, I would say the best way to describe this day is Resurrection Sunday. Happy Resurrection Day. This is, of course, the celebration of Jesus conquering death over 2,000 years ago, which gave you and me the way of eternal life. This life is not the end, praise God, and we find that life through him through Jesus Christ. And at the same time, we realize that there are some who don't quite understand what this day is about. A Sunday school teacher was asking her six-year-olds about the meaning of Easter. Children, she said, do you know why we celebrate Easter? A little girl raised her hand. Yes, Jenny, said the teacher. Jenny said, is Easter when we put on costumes and go trick-or-treating? No, Jenny, that's Halloween. Does anyone else know? A little boy yelled, it's when we set off fireworks. <laughs> no, Jenny, that's Independence Day. Anybody else? A shy little girl in the back said, Easter is when Jesus died. The teacher replied, that's right, April. And what, ha and what happened to Jesus that makes Easter special? Well, he died and got buried. And every Easter he comes out, and if he sees his shadow, there are six more weeks of winter. <laughs> Listen, our, our hope and our prayer today and beyond is that you will know and truly experience the true reality of this day, of Easter, of Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen. You thought you were done repeating that, and so we just got started on that. All right. There are many words to describe the significance of Resurrection Sunday. And, you know, as I think, of, as I think about it, the best word that comes to mind is victory. Say victory. victory. Kids, yell victory. Kids, yell victory. victory. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. I see you out there. So currently, we are in a sermon series theme called Victory in Jesus. Last Sunday, we looked at having victory over my unmet expectations. And for the next couple of months, we're going to look at how to have victory over fear and worry. Have victory over my tongue, the things I say. God has a lot to say about that. We're going to talk about having victory over evil and victory over sin and over my unforgiveness. And also we're going to talk about having victory over my stress. But today we discuss the ultimate, the ultimate victory, which is Jesus. He is risen. He is risen indeed. First Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bibles or you have a Bible app, we're going to look at First Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. It'll also be on the screen behind me, starting in verse 51. Here we go. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. Now, Paul is, is saying this. This is Paul the Apostle. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die but we will all be transformed. Say transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. And this was actually prophesied many, many years previous in Isaiah 25, 8, and in also Hosea 13, 14, says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can say amen. 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 Today's title of my message is victory over death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, God. 
what this day means. I pray, uh, Lord, that you would help each of us, each of us on, in many ways, journeys at different places. God, thank you that you are restoring the world. And I pray, God, that today as we open your word, you would reveal more about who you truly are. And Lord, do the work inside of us, Lord, that, that I can never do, which is to change our hearts and our lives. We give you full permission to do that. We thank you, God, so much today that we celebrate you are alive today and forevermore. We thank you. We're so humbled. Thank you for the gift of your son and sacrificing it on our behalf so that we may be free and alive. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, whether we like to admit it or not, Death is on our minds. In fact, a recent study came out showing that the death rate, that is, those who have died versus those who have been born, that's what I mean by the death rate, this death rate in America among 18 to 64 year olds is actually up 40%. Now maybe you're thinking, well, what kind of Easter message is this? I didn't come here I wasn't planning on ruining a day like today. I just want to say, hang in there, because the news gets so much better, which of course is why we celebrate this day, Resurrection Sunday. So bear with me. The truth is, death is in fact inevitable. Death is unavoidable. In fact, one out of one die. <laughs> uh, since death is certain, are we just wasting our time asking this question today? How can someone have victory over death? According to the scripture passage that we just read, a dramatic change is coming. It's coming for all those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. What's this dramatic change? Let's re look at the passage we read. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And so here's the reality this morning. We were all born in sin. My first point is that sin is our death sentence. We see in our passage in verse 56, for sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. Well, this is what's working against you and me. This is what's working against us. It is our flesh that leads us into sin, and the law, referring to the Ten Commandments, condemned us to die. Why? Well, because we all broke God's law. There's not one person ever that has not broken God's law. Only one, which is Jesus. He is the sinless one. But because of the first human's sin, Adam and Eve, we are all guilty. And so I'm sorry to break the news to any of you that may have thought that, uh, well, I'm kind of not, I'm good. I, I haven't sinned. The truth is we have all broken God's commandments. Romans 5.12 says this, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Did you know that before sin in the garden, there was no such thing as death? And God is restoring his plan and his greater story. It is history, his story that we fit and each of us have a story already written before we were even born and how that fits in God's immaculate, amazing story that's taking place despite what the news may say. Sin is our death sentence. But listen, if I left it there, I wouldn't be telling you the complete truth. Romans 6.23 again says in full, for the wages, the wages means what you're paid. So for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, say free gift, free gift. 
But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is not the end. Praise God. The problem is, is we hate to own up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we, we, we hate to kind of face the reality of our own stuff. In fact, do you know the three hardest things in life to say? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Three hardest things in life to say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Say again. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Okay. Okay, good. You all get to grab some eggs today after service because you are absolutely right. It is true that the three hardest things in life to say is, I did it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And this one, I need help. Guys, are you with me? Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> we are all so hard-headed. We are stubborn, aren't we? This is the truth. We spend much of our lives convincing ourselves and others, I'm right, you're wrong, you need to say sorry for what you did, not me. You with me? Seems easier to point the finger at others, forgetting that three more are in fact pointing back at me, at you. This is, in my opinion, truly an epidemic today. It is the result of sin. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a house. On the outside, it looked extremely successful. I mean, my dad was a successful uh, businessman. Uh, we had everything we needed, a home, clothes, food, and other, other things like got to enjoy Disneyland. We lived in Southern California. Got to enjoy other things. So I'd like to say that growing up, my life was, well, not to be complain. But on the inside, our family was literally being rotted out from the inside. It was being destroyed. And the reason is because my dad, if he was here, he's in Arizona right now, but if he was here right now, he would tell you exactly what I'm telling you. It's his testimony. He, he felt it best in his life to sort of ignore the, the hard questions in life. Why am I here? Is there a God? And what's my purpose? And things like that. Instead, he, he, he was a very busy man and a successful man, but on the inside, him and my mom were, were really struggling in their marriage. And through a series of events that took place, uh, truly, I mean, just an, just an incredible miracle as I look back. I mean, I, I, many of you have heard the story, some have not, but I, I never get tired of sharing my story of how God redeemed the Lane family. And it started with my father when he was uh, driving on the 99 from Southern, from Northern California, I'm sorry, from, from uh, Southern California to Northern California, because we had already moved back here. And he just pulled over to the side of the road and said, God, if you're real, I, I, I give you my life. And, and I have to tell you that he was a completely different man after that. I mean, he, uh, it was weird. Like, all of a sudden, like, we didn't have a TV. And our meal time was what was called Bible devotions, like after dinner. So the life that we were the reality of the life that I was in before that and then this drastic change that took place was kind of like, uh, I'm not sure about this. Like, who is this man? Well, it in fact did, it was a real thing. It really did this really, this Jesus thing, this giving his life to Christ, I mean, really happened. And so much so that a couple months later, he literally led me and my sister to Jesus, where we had to say, look, we, we've sinned. We need a right relationship with God through Jesus. And so we, we actually prayed that prayer. First time I ever prayed in my life, actually. And then a month later, my mom. And, you know, as I look back at that, it would have probably been easier to look at my father and say, well, good on him for admitting his faults. Good on him for admitting his sin. It's about time. At least I'm good because I didn't live the life that he did. In reality, that didn't happen. 
Because as I saw what happened in my dad's life, I'm like, if, if there's a God and God can change him, certainly God can change me. So I realized that I was just as sinful as my father. And I needed to admit, I did it. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I need help. Okay. You know, when I was, uh, when, when Karen and I were uh, in the throes of training our kids and raising them up, uh, parents, we're with you, by the way. We understand fully in the season that your ministry and raising up your kids in the ways of the Lord. But thankfully, our season of that is done. But, <laughs> woo, he is risen. I was just checking to see if you guys are awake there. And in, in that season, we really, uh, Karen and I were really um, uh, one spirit, one mind in this. We had to train our kids early on and as they were growing up. Instead of not owning what you did and ratting on your brother or coming up with some other excuses that your dog ate it or other things that, you know, kids, you probably used. Well, my kids did the same. And so Kara and I had to help our kids understand, look, just acknowledge that you did it. I mean, it was like, especially this one over here. Uh, Connor, love you. Uh, stubborn, but thankful that you're stubborn in Jesus' plan. Thank you, Lord. But um, just acknowledge, just, just acknowledge it, and then admit it, and just say it, you're sorry. And then here's the big one, and it took a while for our kids to get it, and they did. The last thing was, kids, let us help you. So admit it, or acknowledge it, admit it, and then let us help you. Let me say this, church. Let Jesus help you. Amen. He, he's the only answer to all of your questions and all of your needs. He is, in fact, the answer to the way of God. The power of the message and demonstration of the cross is that you can, in fact, be free from the bondage of sin and separation from God. How? Run to the Father. Run to Jesus. Admit, I did it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Please help me. Romans 2 verse 4 says this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so the second thing is, how does, how does one, again, we're asking, how does one have victory over sin and death? Well, the second thing is, Jesus is your replacement. Say replacement. replacement. Jesus is your replacement. How does one have victory over death and over sin? By accepting the ultimate demonstration of love by Jesus for you is what, the truth is, this is what you and I deserved. Good Friday was just three days ago, and we were here in a Good Friday service, and we talked about why is Good Friday called good when Jesus got pummeled on the cross? Well, the truth is, it's good because Jesus took on the penalty that you and I deserved. He did not deserve to pay that price. We did. We deserved death. It was our sin, not his. But through his grace and forgiveness, he literally took on the punishment for your sin, for my sin. All sin, past, present, and future. I mean, who does that? Jesus does. And he did. Jesus died in your place and in mine. Some of you know this, that we have a few groups that are meeting up in homes. And we are several, a uh, couple months into this. And it's a a course called Alpha. And Alpha simply means the beginning. And we're talking about the foundations of our faith in Christ. And we're, we've been asking questions, well, who is Jesus? Did he even, was that just a myth or is, who is that really? Why did he die? And who's the Holy Spirit? And what is the church? And why do I have to be a part of that? We're, we're talking about this and we're a couple weeks in. And a couple weeks ago, uh, we talked about Jesus being our replacement. I want to show you this video in just a couple minutes. That will be right behind me. Die for me. The Apostle 
Peter puts it like this. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's been described as the self-substitution of God. What does that mean? On the 31st of July, 1941, sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp. A prisoner had escaped. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men, arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewicek. And when he was selected, Francis Gajewicek cried out, said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they will never see me again. At that moment, a, a small man with wire-framed glasses took off his cap and he walked forward and he said, I'm Catholic priest. He said, I don't have a, a wife and children. I want to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The name of that man was Maximilian Kobe, 47 years old. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. An amazing guy, he begins. Apparently the atmosphere in there felt like a church in there. Eventually they needed the salvation bunker for other people. And so on the 14th of August, 1941, he was given a lethal injection of carbonic acid. 41 years later, on the 10th of October, 1982, the death of Maximilian Colby was put in its proper perspective. There in St. Peter's Square, Rome, in a crowd of 150,000 people with 26 cardinals, 300 bishops and archbishops, was Francis Gardnice. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kobe on that occasion in these terms. He said it was a victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Maximilian Kobe had died for someone else instead of someone else. That someone else was Francis Gavnice. I happened to see his obituary in the independent newspaper. He died at the age of 93. And he had spent the rest of his life going around the world telling people what Maximilian Kobe had done for him. Because he had died in his place. And in an even more remarkable way, Jesus died instead of you and instead of me. Christ Jesus is your replacement. Say replacement. Replacement. Isaiah 53, 4-6 says this. It was our grief he bore, our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and bruised for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was lashed and we were healed. We, every one of us, have strayed away like sheep. We who left God's past to follow our own, yet God laid on him the guilt and sins of every single one of us. One of the best quotes that I have ever seen, actually, uh, and I think it's appropriate today, is this. Yet they called him master. He had no degrees, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. His name is Jesus. Yeah. He is risen. Last point. How does one have victory over sin and death? Here's the point. Jesus is our victory over sin and death. He is our victory. Verse 57, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so how do you have victory in death? How do you have victory over death and over sin? It is only through Jesus. Yes, Satan and his evil scheme to kill Jesus 
for good fell by the wayside. What looked like initially a win for hell turned into a victory for heaven. And it wasn't just for that moment. It was the victory until kingdom come, which gives us life. Jesus is the one who gives us life. And because of this defeat, we who are in Christ have victory over death. Jesus, in fact, conquered death. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay, one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes. I end with this story. At this time last year, the reality and certainty of death was literally staring right at me in the face. Last Easter season, I was not in a church service. Uh, actually, quite the opposite. I wasn't with my brothers and sisters. I was in a hospital room, isolated, away from my family and my friends. What got me in the hospital was... Uh, Double severe pneumonia. And before I got over my mail, I needed to get help. I realized that because I was really having a hard time breathing. And I realized that something was very wrong. And so it took my wife to tell me, Rob, you need to get to the hospital. And that's all I needed to get. When I got to the hospital, they did about three hour testing on me. And what the doctor had said based on my chest x-ray, for example, was he had never seen anything like that in the year and a half of this pandemic. And I, I truly, as I look back at that, he was not saying that because I was the next in line. I, it was really a severe situation. Uh, my oxygen levels, what is considered normal, anything under 90%, I was in the 60 percentile at this point. And the doctor looked at my wife and I and said, prepare to be in the hospital minimum one month. And quite a, quite a very difficult prognosis at that point. And I was admitted, this was all the week before Easter last year. And so I was admitted on that Monday. This was the day after Palm Sunday. It was 3 p.m., again, the week before Easter. So, there was a real rustling, and it was a severe situation. My heart levels dropped significantly, and also my oxygen levels dropped, and they were not recovering. The nurses and the doctors were all running frantically. I could see the panic on their face. I, mean, I didn't really feel much because I was medicated. But at that point, what happened was the doctor came in and said, we need to right now rush you to ICU and put you on a ventilator. So the doctor was really good about letting my wife know and keep her updated as to how my prognosis was going. And at that point, in tears, my wife said to my doctor, is there anything else we can do? This became the new prognosis for me. He said, well, we can storm heaven with our prayers. And that's what happened. I mean, our youth group that Wednesday night spent hours out at the field of faith, right over here on Jeff Bryan Lane here in Wilson, praying for my healing. It went viral. I mean, people were sharing it all over the place, even, even in other countries. I had somebody tell me soon after my recovery that there was literally over 30,000 people praying for me. And that Wednesday was not a good day. But I was thankful that God decided to have a different plan. And through the prayers of his people, and through the encouragement, and the uh, incredible support of, of course, our faith community, Living Water Church, and extended out, that next day, actually that night, my fever broke. I had a fever of about 103.5 for like three straight weeks. And it broke that night. Because originally the doctor said, look, if things don't change, we're going to have to do this on Thursday morning. And so on Thursday morning, I was actually able to get out of bed and eat. I was actually able to eat. 
the doctor came in and he, he like literally fell over. Like, what are you doing out of bed? And I said, I feel great, doc, I'm ready to go home. And uh, he said, no, that's, uh, that's must be the meds talking. Uh, but nevertheless, I was starting to feel better and things shifted. And literally God continued to use people to pray for me and my family. And I started progressively getting better. And I started doing physical therapy and walking around and my oxygen levels were actually doing very well. I wasn't as winded, things were recovering and my body was responding, it was just incredible. And the doctors and the nurses would come in and say, you know, you have a miracle story, we haven't seen this. And you know, what is it? I would say it's the prayers of God's people and they would be like, someone would be like, okay, well, you can, yeah, you can clap. It's the prayers of God's people. And there was some that kind of believed in a different kind of science. They said, well, like, what else? What is it? <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta be able to test that. What is it? Uh, no, no, it's the prayer. It's God. It's He's real. And uh, my doctor came in and he called me Reverend Robbie, by the way. That was my term in the hospital for that time. And he said, Robin, Ro Reverend Robbie, if you're well by Easter, this was on uh, stat, uh, this was on Friday. If you're well by Easter, it will be a miracle. I I'm here to tell you that literally on that next Monday at 3 p.m. I was discharged. It was exactly seven days that I was in the hospital, and I went home without any oxygen or any medicine, and that started the road to recovery. And this is the picture of my first day back home. And, uh, you know, I look back at that and some people have said, well, like, do you have survivor's guilt? Because not many people actually did experience that. Uh, the truth is for me, uh, I, I don't have survivor's guilt. I'm so thankful that God's not done with me yet. And he's not done with you yet. Today is a day where we rejoice because God is risen and he, he has a plan for each of us too. Our time here is not done. We are praying for some people in our church who are really hanging on. And we're praying for Mary Gomer, and as she's probably watching in the hospital room, we are with you, sister. We are praying for you. Sherry, who had recently uh, brain surgery, she is doing very well, uh, recovering. We got to shower this morning, and she's at home. And so praise God. Praise God that he's got a plan. This was an email recently from my doctor. I reached out to him a couple weeks ago. So I wanted to, I want, I wanted to invite him here. But uh, because he's a doctor, he's pretty busy, but he did respond. He said, Pastor Robbie, hello there. Thank you very much for your email. I was just thinking about you and your family as I was pondering about the upcoming Easter season and how fast the year has come and gone. It's been almost a year when the Lord Almighty led me to cross paths with this wonderful and beloved pastor who needed hospital care due to the pandemic. Lord Jesus never disappoints those who pray and call on him indeed. Please send my love and best wishes to your wife, to your church family, and the rest of your family in Jesus' name. Well, there he is. And there he is. Storming heaven with our prayers. We're closing with some of you may say, Amen to that. <laughs> our bodies are wasting away. More than the physical, listen, God wants to save and heal you from spiritual death. Luke chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, Jesus is speaking and he says, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to cut, I've come to call not those who think they are righteous or those who think they are perfect, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. He is risen. He is risen. Let's go ahead and bring the worship team up. We'll close out our time and Kids, we're almost there. I know you're getting antsy. You've been great. Haven't the kids been great? They're still up and down. Not only they're out in the Southern Church, but we're thankful that you're with us today. And we're going to be all out there in just a second. Let's stand and pray. Before I pray, and as we um, are in that posture now, we uh, do this every single week because we are a church that 
doesn't like to say that we are a praying church. We actually believe that and we believe in prayer, obviously. Uh, it's not something that, that we just kind of do on the side. We know that God changes things through the prayers of his people. Amen? Amen? And so this time there may be some of you, like this Easter may be kind of a new one, like the, like learning the true meaning of Easter. Some of you, I realize, maybe on the on the journey of what that is and for the first time you've learned something new. Some of you, this is just kind of a normal thing. You already know, and this is just kind of a repeat day. And sometimes in that, we can kind of be maybe a little careless in what God has done for us. So we return back to him. The cross is level for all. And there's not one that's greater, not one that's less. There's Jesus, who has covered all of our sins, past, present, and future. If you want to receive prayer, we'll have people over here. These are folks that really walk in their gift of praying. And when they pray, things happen. That's not a magicious, magician thing. That's a, actually a spiritual gift thing. And we're grateful for these people who walk in their gifting. If you need prayer for anything, if it's salvation, you're not sure what happens after you die. Listen, you can be assured today that you can have eternal life through Jesus. Come over here and receive prayer. Some of you are dealing with some stuff in your body. And you need Jesus to respond. You need, to, you need healing in Jesus' name. Come over here and receive prayer. Some of you have been dealing with some evil. Some stuff that the enemy is trying to discourage you and get you to give up. And all those things. We call it demonic harassment. All we need to say is in Jesus' name leave. Come over here and receive prayer. And we will be praying with you. Father, we thank you for your love. For your grace for your forgiveness, for your power in conquering death. Because, Jesus, you have done that.